Thank you. Thank you, first of all, to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it is a real opportunity, and I'm so happy to be able to speak to young people, uh, shakers, movers, uh, people bringing some change. Um, so this presentation will, is a little bit about the region where I work, but I want to really speak to you today about my big love for fog, which is a strange situation to be in love with the fog, but that's just, just, just the way it is. Um, so uh, let me go without uh, delay in this. Um, so the situation in, in, in south of Morocco, uh, just like in a lot of regions of other parts of the world, there is the issue of the certification, increasing the certification with the change of climate patterns and the lack of rain. Um, and when you have a population that lives and thrives on the use of rainwater for their livelihood, then you have serious social issues that come uh, as a side product from then migration and from poverty. And these are uh, Amazir, what used to be called in the literature, in anthropology, the Berber communities, which today we prefer an emic description, that is the people describe the word, uh, their identity with their own word, which is the Amazir communities. The Amazir communities, once they migrate to cities where there is Arabic domination, there is a loss of language, of course, there is a reinvention of a new identity, but with the loss of language, there is also a loss of practices and beliefs and knowledge and skills that are related to the land and the cleaning of the trees and the grooming of the argan trees and so on and so forth. So um, the environmental consequences were, are also very serious because the loss of land and labor and the hand uh, is that the, uh, the, the region where we work, and I will show you some images, actually, in fact, uh, get degraded, especially when there is no one to groom the trees. Um, so the solution that the organization, and we can talk later if there is a question about the history of the organization, um, uh, has come up with is to think about what's the resources that are available. And I'd like us to stop a little bit at the etymology of the word resource. Resource is not just something that we extract, it is something that ties us to the world in which we live. It is about bridging this gap that modernity and the way that we live today has created between us as human beings, hubris, you know, believing that we own the world and the environment in which we live. Then, so the solution has been to look at what's available locally, and what's available locally is a lot of fog, but there is no rain. And so we started looking in 2006, this is a very long, projects in the making into what type of uh, uh, solutions can be harnessed from fog. And you know, there is a whole literature about fog harvesting. We are not the first one to do this, and I will be speaking a little bit about it. Um, so we've uh, harvested, started thinking and building to harvest fog in 2006. A lot of studies, a lot of evaluation, cost-benefit analysis, funding, uh, the reaction of the communities not liking fog uh, to today to um, building the, the fog project that then has become today what it is today. And now there is always this idea of the expansion. We have been at the idea of the expansion since 2020 when COVID hit, um, and we're still at that place. We haven't moved in the organization. So this is where um, I work. Um, I am not from this region, but uh, I have uh, married in this region and I have adopted my family, my husband's family and his ways, which is very interesting from somebody who grew up in a very urban area to become a, a, a rural-based person. Um, so uh, I do have a sort of uh, uh, stand in the situation as an anthropologist, so I am not totally, totally uh, emic. I'm not totally uh, part of the community, but I have just a let's say the big toe, not the small toe, uh, in the community. I do speak the language, but not fluently enough, I can understand. But I have worked here for about 10 years now, um, and this is a region that is extremely dry. 
that has three major sources of, of income, of livelihood. It has uh, argan trees, it has honey, and it has the uh, uh, fruits of um, prickly pear, the cactus fruits, which within the last three years has been totally destroyed and devastated. So now the community doesn't have even that source of livelihood. So this side map shows you, in fact, where we are located um, in a mountain called Bout Mesgida, which is in Berber stands for the place of the of the mosque. But I think, as an anthropologist, again, it is a place that has a sacred kind of sense in it. Uh, uh, the communities go up there uh, at 1,223 to do some, used to do some rituals they don't do anymore, and that's the place where um, actually the fog comes. Um, and Sidi Ifni used to be um, uh, uh, Santa Maria del Mar Pequena, excuse my Spanish, not very good, um, and it is a, uh, it used to be the, um, uh, the capital of colonial space. So there is a lot of history that ties this region of the world to uh, this part of the world, especially with communities of uh, um, the, Berber, the Amazigh communities uh, um, uh, having um, uh, some uh, organic relations with this uh, part of, of Spain. So this is what I told you the people live off. Uh, they live off uh, um, uh, some water. They have uh, traditional ways of accessing water. There are wells that go very deep. There is a very traditional knowledge of making wells, which by the way, like in a lot of parts of the world, is being lost because now we have machines um, that do the, 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 um, the digging. Um, we have, and the women are the ones who used to walk for hours. We have done a, um, uh, a study and followed when we did our baseline study in 2011, and we found out that it's about three hours and a half per day per woman to bring some water during the low season, in the high season, when it's really hot, it's a little bit more than that. And uh, so imagine half of your day is just gone to go get water. So um, thinking about the resource again, um, and some of the livelihood um, uh, concerning, for instance, the bees. There's a lot of bee community, um, at which unfortunately is equally dying by the millions. I'm sorry, this is a bleak picture. So I want to show you, I hope this works. What do I do? I press again. OK. So I want to show you the system, how it works for the fog collection. Uh, this is a film that was done by a German uh, company uh, that filmed us, that came and filmed us. And so the fog comes via um, uh, the wind. It's pushed. It's a passive system. And then the active system is the, is the wind. And so I always like to speak about the dance of fog. So I, uh, oh, okay, well, yeah. Um, I'd like to show it again. Um, no, it's not letting me go back. Okay, sorry. There you go. Yeah, so the fog comes and goes through the small nets um, of this is called a Rachel mesh. We don't use this Rachel mesh anymore. And then with gravity, it goes into the gutter. And as it gathers, it goes down. And I will give you some of the numbers later. So I want to just speak a little bit about the history of the project. So we started, we launched the idea of our collection in 2006 with a study. Because you can't do something without doing a study. I mean, it's obvious. Um, we completed the first phase in uh, 2013 with uh, a cloud with a unit called the fog collector and there is a whole history about uh, fog collection the fog collectors were built and systematized by an organization in canada called the fog quest and um, they are great. Uh, they are using the Rachel mesh that I told you about, but they're single ply, and they are very um, uh, um, fragile in front of high winds. And the region where we work has about 120 kilometers per hour of wind. So you can imagine how 
um, it, it will be just simply destroyed very quickly. And actually, that film that you saw earlier um, was made when the company, uh, when a film company came to film the destruction of the four collectors um, um, in 2006 and, and, and 14 or 15. Uh, 15, yes. Um, then we, in 2014, we signed an amazing partnership with uh, moral people. I always call them moral people uh, in the sense that they, of course, they have businesses and they're concerned about earning money, but they're also concerned about the work that they do. And so this company of companies financed us and financed another organization called the Wasser Stiftung, the Water Foundation in Germany, and one of the uh, uh, engineers, an industrial engineer, a designer, um, designed, thought that, okay, you know, there is potential in fog, however, the structure is not good enough. And so he spent years thinking and designing uh, a new form that he, he eventually uh, created, which is called now the cloud fissure, and it is a 3D structure, and I will, I hope I, can show you the, the, the close-up. So the first one was one ply, a simple Rachel mesh, and the second one where there was a next generation, which was the 3D, where the amount of water simply tripled. So the average mean of water collected in uh, the Rachel mesh was 10 liters per one square meter with the, um, uh, fall, with the cloud fissure 3D, uh, we went to 22 liters uh, and a half per one square meter. So this is the place where we have the project. The project is on top of the mountain. So uh, I will not tell you about the logistics. Well, please ask me. <laughs> um, the logistics were a killer to bring all this material up to the mountain with no roads. So I always kind of joke and say our best friends are donkeys. I love donkeys. I think they have beautiful eyes and they're hard workers and they don't complain. And to get all this material up um, to build. So we have built um, 32 units of the uh, uh, fog collectors of the cloud fishers, sorry, I confuse the names all the time. And we have been able to service 16 villages. Um, there is about a thousand people of, of people who live on, uh, in this region. Uh, um, there is, of course, other uh, family members, the men who work outside who come. And so we get up to about 1,300 people who drink the fog water. And during COVID, which was very dry, we had actually to buy water. We were really in a situation of extreme stress. We couldn't get out of our houses and we had to manage the water. It was a very difficult moment. However, uh, they were, these 16 villages were the only communities with um, continuous access to water. Um, and when we are saying that, uh, uh, just like uh, the young woman uh, earlier said about thinking not only about business and the needs of human beings, uh, we always do in our accounting and our thinking to include the bees, the animals, because we are in a mixed communities. We are in uh, uh, communities that rely on each other, from the tree to the animal, to, to the human being, and this is a very, very circular economy, but that's a synthetic word, I think, but it is an ingrained and uh, continuous symbiotic way of living. Um, and we also give water to schools for free. We don't charge, water is paid for. Anything that becomes free loses value, unfortunately, in a world where uh, capitalism is uh, rule. Um, so I want to speak about the, some of the history of fog collection. Uh, I think that uh, uh, fog really fascinates, really seriously fascinates, because uh, it has this uh, aesthetic dimension that's uh, uh, kind of um, 
uh, appeals to people, and then it's uh, a lot of sensorization. You know, wow, everywhere I go, there's always this question, how do you do that? You drink fog, that's impossible, how do you do that? So, you know, we don't, we don't think about the whole history uh, of human mankind, of human kind of mankind and about the adaptation to the natural resources and how people have lived. And so I would like to tell you a just very briefly, since I am in Spain, but now we'll go to the, uh, to the Canary Islands, where some of the first written reports about fog harvesting happened in the 16th century with somebody called um, Bartolomeu Las Casas, who was going from Spain here into the New Americas, and they stop in the Canary Islands. And like the story of um, uh, the cartoons, I think they could be made into a winning cartoon, uh, stories of the cartoons. So this young woman from the, uh, the, the local communities who are believed to be Amazir, Berber, um, were, uh, uh, had water, but this is volcanic. Uh, islands. So where does the water come from? Well, it comes from fog. And so she showed the, the tree or the fountain of a life tree, the dragon tree um, that was called at the time in, 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 in the Canary Islands in uh, Tenerife. Um, and it was very, very large tree. Uh, about, uh, you needed about 16 people to hold hands open to be able to turn the circumference of the tree. And this is the tree in which, through which people drank water. They built a little wall um, uh, surrounding the tree, and there was someone already counting how, many, how much water every person from the community was getting, and, and so on. So the idea is that water fog collection has always existed, and there are other examples through the Atacama, um, uh, desert, uh, and there is uh, other examples in Oman, in other places around the world where trees or uh, mounds of rocks are used to, to trap water. And some of the first experiments that were done were done in what is today Namibia, at the time Rhodesia, in the 1960s. And it was a way of making sure that people had water to drink. So then, in the 1970s, the first experiments started really taking place, and that's when we had the fog collectors with the Rochelle mesh. Then we have now the cloud fishers with the 3D structure, and this is the one that we have in our web, in our uh, in the Butmesgida um, site, and uh, that we have an average of 42 tons of water every night when there is fog. But th there are problems with fog um, as a resource. And right now, there's a lot of talk about um, dynamic harvesting systems uh, that will use uh, active energy. But the question is, what kind of active energy? Uh, is it just going to be yet another more extractive technology that humans use. And there are some serious issues concerning the ethics of doing this. OK. Uh, how much time do I still have? That's it. I'm done. OK, so I didn't talk. I will just show you the type of fog that I am speaking about. There are different types of fog. So I would like you to see this is the kind of fog that we harvest. It's not any fog that can be harvested. It's extremely thick very poetic, very beautiful, very enthralling, wet, and amazing. Not good for flying, though. <laughs> this is on top of the mountain. Thank you so much.